so much of design and product and positioning is around really understanding like what is genuine human behavior at scale and then how do you help people bridge the gap between what they want to do the person they really want to be and the day-to-day -day actions that they take so I started off, I was an electrical engineer and computer scientist. Um, and then I also had a second major in economics. When I first went into the work world, I was very driven, but I'm not sure that I had ambition. I never even thought that I would even be a manager. Like that just never even occurred to me. Like I had my first job in a cubicle and I assumed I was going to spend the next 40 years in a cubicle. And at some point I was going to hit $75,000 a year and I was going to be like, you know, live in the like upper middle class lifestyle. There were so many things that I just didn't even have on my radar. I would say I'm ambitious about the work more than like ambitious about career or at least early on. So like really into the work, I was a super nerd and loved that. And I just loved like solving new problems. And uh, I moved out of telecommunications. I think I went into finance after that, which was also really about moving massive amounts of data around. And I found that once I solved a problem, I just never wanted to solve that problem again. Like I felt like I wanted to do something new and different know that concept of the seven-year itch I do actually think that like I've had like every seven years or so I've actually had a very dramatic uh, career change and I had a little bit of my first career crisis where I've had many and uh and then I wasn't even sure what I wanted to do I kind of started exploring and like getting myself invited to meetings or like just like finding people who are doing things that I was like, I don't even know what that thing is. So let me figure out what that is, spending time with them and started trying to build credibility because if you do one thing really, really well, like if you're a great developer or a great marketing, like SEO specialist or something, like that's what people want you to do. That's what they think about when they think of you. And if you're looking to make switches, I think it is harder for people to think about you in a different context. And that's something I've experienced over and over. Something that you said when we talked, which I wrote down, which is if people see you as a fixer, then you only get broken stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's almost like it goes from being an honor to a burden in a way. Mm -hmm. Like it's like, oh, wow, I'm great at this thing. People recognize it. And then at a certain point, you're like, oh my gosh, it's not like I wake up every day and it's like framework development, you know, like there are other parts of me. I started like dabbling in project management. I had no idea how to tell people what to do. So building that skill of like, not just being an individual contributor, but like learning how to influence other people. And especially as a junior project manager, like skill of responsibility without authority, like those are very hard skills. Like, and it's very easy to dismiss people. And I think this is actually true for many women, like, especially younger in your career, it's so easy for people to be like, wow, what do you know? So I got into product management. I became a people leader. And then I ended up running the technology function for a business unit in a fortune 50 company. And then I was like, oh, I'm done with tech. So they were like, Sarita is like, if you need a technology exec, that's the one to go to. And I was like, oh, Again, just like it went from being an honor to being kind of a burden. And so I was like, no, I want to try something else. I want to, what is this product thing? What is this strategy thing? And of course it's like, no, you're a tech person. You don't know anything about strategy. And I was like, like, okay, there's this like magic strategy thing people know about. You're like, oh, I need to figure out what that is. And it turns out strategy is not magic. It's really logic. And it's about like understanding human behavior and understanding business and having like business acumen, right? All of these things. I would almost say when I tried to fake it till I made it, like I, it almost put more pressure on me because I just, I think this is true for many of us. Like if you're being authentic, then you can chill and you can just be like, uh, I don't really know what we're doing here. Like you just say it. One of the best pieces of guidance that I've ever had was from a boss who was like in some ways a really phenomenal boss in some ways, a very toxic and damaging boss. When I finally got like the sort of top of the area that I was in first few times, I started going to our executive meeting. I really felt that I was like, I don't belong here. I mean, I'm like a foot shorter than anybody else in the room, maybe a decade younger. And like all of these things where I just felt, oh my gosh, they're going to know. The CEO, who was my boss at the time, pulled me aside and was like, it's almost like you have childish body language. And when you say things, if I transcribe the words that you say, it's right on. But the way you say it, it's like, you kind of like minimize yourself. And it's true. It's like, it's, you don't even know how much you can get in your own way. And so that's why I think with this whole, like fake it till you make it an imposter syndrome and being in uncomfortable situations, like, you know, okay. So I'm going to this meeting. These people maybe are 10 years more experienced or whatever, uh, but there is a reason I'm here. And so let me just think back, like, why was I even invited here? And then you feel it. I mean, of course it's going to be like, oh my God, they know, you know, you have all those little things and then you have to catch the thought and be like, but do they, but they invited you here. They're, they could easily uninvite you here. 
when you put people up on a pedestal like that, you automatically downgrade yourself. And so be conscious of that because it's a really bad habit. I think it's way better to like, I know this sounds cheesy, but like, you know, journal, talk to people. For me, and one of my biggest personal mantras when I'm stressed or nervous about something is to have a cool and collected mind and just be like, okay, like I recognize I'm feeling this physiological response, but I'm going to be mm-hmm. cool, collected, brave. Find people that you trust who are willing to like go deep with you and being open-minded enough to have your beliefs challenged because you, if you have somebody who really uh, has your best interests at heart and is willing to challenge you, that's a lucky combination and like, hold on to that person forever. I love the line of like every year, look back on who you were last year. And if you're not embarrassed, you're not doing enough. And I think that's kind of a cool concept. Give yourself a moment to just pause and reflect on like, what have you done? Because there's so much like who you are today is not who you were five years ago or 10 years ago. Would you say that? things that you're saying to yourself, to your loved ones, of course Mm -hmm. you wouldn't. Almost everybody has like that mean inner critic. And actually, I almost feel like the mean inner critic is kind of helpful in some ways. You know, your ego never gets too big, but it's also like, uh, you need to right size it. Like you Mm -hmm. need to kind of calibrate that because you Mm want to make sure you hold yourself accountable. Like when there's mistakes, when someone has feedback for you, you do want to be open-minded and think like, okay, is there truth to that? Then it's like sort of identifying, is this valuable to me? Take Mm -hmm. what's valuable and then leave the rest. I think maybe there's almost no better model than like asking yourself, what am I really thinking? What am I really feeling? And then questioning it. Like what assumptions go into that? This is why journaling, I think it's so valuable. It's just like, why do I think that? What experiences have shown that? What experiences contradict that? And then if you're feeling nervous or badly or whatever, inadequate, it's like, but don't you have a whole history? Like, haven't you done so many great things in your career? Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to discount the things that you've done that have been impressive and focus in on the embarrassing things or the negative things. I mean, that's part of growing, but it's also probably not the right place to focus people discount how much we're influenced by the people we're around, like the ripple effect. And there's, I mean, there's just so much evidence around like the people that you spend the most of your time with are the ones who help frame your outlook. They help you see what the possibilities are. And if you're around people who are really judgmental and negative, that has its own sort of impact on you. If you look at them and like aspirationally, are these people who are like actively adding to who you are as a person? Do they help with your outlook? Do they help with your mindset? Do they live lifestyles that are like aligned to your values? This notion of radical candor, I think sometimes can be misinterpreted as a reason to make cruelty okay. It's hard to know is like when you're giving somebody feedback, like it is a very natural to almost have like a physiological response and just hear the first thing. And so by the time you're on the second or third thing, people can't comprehend in the same Mm -hmm. way. Like they're still thinking about the first thing. I'll just say I'm a huge fan of candor. I myself have had to also figure out how to navigate this because I, for so long, I was like, very, very frank. I do believe in like compassionate candor. And I think the piece for me that I've really, really worked on as, especially as a leader is like coming in with a spirit of generosity. I like, I can make all these assumptions. I I'm not that person. I wasn't in their situation. So let me just ask, let me come to it with curiosity and with a genuine belief that like nobody ever wants to do bad work. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever wants to disappoint their colleagues, you know, all of these, like all of these things. And so like, how would I want to be approached? And when I think about this candor piece, I would hundred percent start with curiosity and with compassion. And then maybe, maybe that gives you a path to candor. Of course, with inclusion, it's so situational and there can be all kinds of issues going on. The one thing that I think maybe is like universal though, is just thinking about who is getting opportunities and how do they know those opportunities exist? So there's a lot around, you know, this idea of like fit, like cultural fit. And that one becomes kind of inadvertently like a place for hidden biases. I mean, that all makes sense, but it's just because, you know, it's proximity. You got to see it. Like who, who might be interested in this that you don't even know about? Or who might not even know that they're interested because they never even thought that was a possibility mm-hmm. for them. If say, if you have an opportunity for a new role and you're thinking like, oh, I know who I want to recruit for that role. It seems normal that you'd be like, I want to reward that person. I've seen them do good work. But the, the bummer about that is that it's just that you have proximity to that person. And there may actually be incredibly talented people who may be a better fit. So I think I would definitely stop and ask what steps can I take to actually widen the pool of prospective people for whatever this thing is. And then doing the legwork of like not just spending my time in all the same places. Like, you know, if I, if I'm around the same people all the time, I'm not going to meet new people. It's quite difficult in the sense of like, it has to be very, very deliberate. You have to put time into it. And then you have to think about like what priorities, like 
if this is something you're prioritizing, what are you not going to do yeah. with the time that you have? And I think that for me, I would, with three kids and all the things that I do, it is quite difficult for me to be like, I'm going to like make time for this. There is definitely an archetype of people who are like, I like this job. I just want to get really good at this job. I'm going to go deep into this job. Mm -hmm. And that's one type of person. And then there are plenty of people who are like, what's, what else is there? And I, I feel like FOMO is not the right word because it's sort of maybe drive more than that, but just like this sort of need to like keep growing and taking on new things. Mm -hmm. Like if you have like this sort of insatiable sort of need for growth, it seems so much easier to find a new job outside. And I think it's pretty easy to discount what you can get if you can stay inside of a firm and really grow and like build mm -hmm. like loyalty, longevity in that firm, especially when you're thinking about like building expertise, like subject matter expertise, institutional mm -hmm. knowledge, all of those sorts of things and a reputation for millennials and for Gen Z's as well. Like this idea that like my affiliation is more with the work that I do more than the employer that I work for. The two biggest drivers for me are why does this company even exist? Like, is it here to do something legitimately good? And then who are the people? People I'm going to be spending my time with? Like, are these going to be the kind of people where at the end of the day, I actually feel like lifted and better. And I was part of something. That's why it's so incumbent on employers to really like put their money where their mouths are in terms of like, what is it that we're here to do? Like, what is, what purpose do we serve? If our purpose is only to make money, you're probably not going to keep people. That means that employers have to really focus on that and that they're actively finding opportunities for people in the organization. So I think maybe one of my favorite things ever in my career is just using the idea of job crafting and like, how do I look at this organization and see what problems need to be solved where I have skills? Like I want to, that could be a stretch assignment for me because you probably don't want to do something that you've already done before. Maybe you do, but probably you're going to be like, oh, there's a really interesting, juicy problem that needs to be solved. You know what? I think I can figure this one out. If you haven't read about job crafting or if you're not familiar with the concept, I will say that that's been transformative for me in my career. I think that's why I've had so many opportunities and been able to kind of get out of the pigeonhole so often is being able to be like, I want to do that thing. And then people are like, but that's not who you are. And then you're like, give me a chance or actually just do back. <laughs> I'm just say a little bit secretive, like just start doing the thing and then come back and be like, here's some ideas. And then people are like, oh, wow. Okay. Find the biggest problem that your boss is facing or your boss's boss is facing and figure out how to fix that problem.